Good evening, everybody. Officially, it is class number 14 for College Geometry. Today, we are going to continue with our discussion of graphing. Uh, next time, by the way, we've got transformations. Transformations should not take up an entire class. Transformations probably should only take 20 or 30 minutes. After we finish the material for class 15, I will spend the last half hour of the last class, give or take, going over any questions you might have. Uh, so please be prepared. You know, Come to class 16, 15 on Wednesday with plenty of questions, if you want me to go over, go over anything, if you're stumped by some of the homeworks, if you're not sure what to expect on the exam, or anything to that effect, uh, I will be happy to take questions then. But today we've got some more graphing to discuss, and today we're going to discuss graphing equations. Last time, if, well, if you took algebra with me back in the summer, we also discussed similar things then. Uh, this time we're going to spend a little bit less time discussing things that just about graphing itself. We're kind of going to, you know, gloss over that a little bit. What we're really going to do is we're going to focus on graphing equations as they relate to polygons and as they relate to uh, to you know sections of shapes and that sort of thing. First thing is the is graphing the equation of a line. Now really what an equation of a line is <coughs> it is the relationship between the x and y variables on a line. For example, and I'm going to pop this in here for one second. Okay, there we go. For example, now I'm not going to explain how to do this so far. I just want to draw a line and I want to illustrate something. If I tell you that uh, x plus y equals 7, Let's just say I give you a shape, and I, I'm sorry, I give you a, um, I give you a very simple equation, x plus y equals seven. Now, obviously, you don't know what x is, and you don't know what y is, but they could have different values. If x is one, then what's y? If x is one, then what is y? Six. Okay. If x is two, then y, of course, is five. If x is three, then y is four. Again, that's just common sense. Now, that is the relationship between x and y. If I were to establish this on a graph, now last time we learned a little bit about graphing and a little bit about the x and the y axes. Let's say I were to plot these points over here. x and y in this case is one and six. This one would be 2 and 5. Again, the first value is always the x value. The second value is always the y value. So 1 and 6 would be 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be the 1, 6 point. This would be the 2, 5 point. This would be the 3, 4 point, etc. Basically, if you were to establish a relationship between these two, what you would find is that it would be a line that would look something like this. Actually, a little... Let me make that a little bit more exact. Yeah, like like this. Yeah, the line would look something like this, and it would go in both directions forever. Now, obviously, this graph can't go forever because this is a limited drawing. But the point is, this would be the equation that illustrates the relationship, assuming x plus y equals 7. So, for example, if x is, if y is 0, then x would have to be 7. If x would be 0, then y would have to be 7. If x is negative 1, then y is 8. And remember, that also works. You know, if x is negative 1 and if x is uh, negative 1 and y is positive 8, that also works to equal 7. And 8 and negative 1 also works. In other words, a, an equation, whenever you have just an x value and a y value, in an equation, the way you can plot the relationship between x and y is illustrated in the form of y, in the form of a straight line. Basically, every equation unless you have one of them that's squared. You know, if x is squared or y is squared, then things become a little bit more complex. We're going to discuss that a little bit later on today. But basically, when you have x and y in one equation, the, it turns out to be a straight line. Okay, now let us look at... Uh, one second, actually. All right, let me put it. Put another graph. There we go. Let's put another piece of graph paper in here. Okay, there we go. Now, 
The standard way in which an equation is written when you're talking about a linear equation, which means an equation that forms a straight line like the one we just saw, is you write it in y equals mx plus b form, where m is the slope of the line and b is the y-intercept. So for example, if I give you an equation that y equals 2x plus 3, the y and the x values obviously are variable. They change based on each other. When the x goes in one direction, the y also moves. But this tells you the two things that you should need to be able to graph this line. Now again, in algebra, it's a little bit more of a, of, of a basic course. We spend a lot more time discussing it. But graphing this equation is actually very easy. The first thing you can do is establish the y-intercept. The y-intercept is where the line crosses the y-axis. And this happens to be a 3. So it's 1, 2, 3. So we'll put one point over here. This is point 0, 3. And the reason why you know that it's on that 0, 3 applies is because 3 is the y-intercept. So 0, 3 is where it crosses the y-axis over here. Now the slope we know is what? Well, the slope is whatever is next to the x. So the slope is 2. A positive 2 slope means up 2 for every 1 over. So I can go up 2, 1 over, and put the next point over here. Up 2, 1 over, put the next point over here. Up 2, 1 over, put the next point over here. And if I draw this line, really the truth is all you need is really two points. Uh, once you have two points, you should, you'll, there's only one line that you can make that goes through it. But if you make three points or more, it actually makes it a little bit easier to draw. So this is the what our line is going to look like. You can, it really extends infinitely in either direction. And this line is y equals 2x plus 3. OK, let's try something else. Let's try a slightly different equation. What if I tell you, I want you to graph this line. I want you to graph a line that says 2x plus 4y equals negative 2. Let's just say for argument's sake. Now, the problem with this, can you graph this? Sure, you can graph it. But the thing is, it makes it a lot easier when you get it into y equals mx plus b form. In other words, when you get the y all by itself, and on the other side of the equation, you have an x term and you have a number term. So how do you get this into y equals mx plus b form? Well, the first thing you got to do is get the y term by itself. How do you get rid of everything but the y term? In other words, I'll circle this in orange because we're going to want the y term by itself. How do you get the y term by itself on one side of the equal sign? The answer is get rid of whatever's next to it. Get rid of the 2x term. So if we can subtract 2x from this side and subtract 2x from that side. In this case, we've got 4y equals, now this is minus 2x. Now you can't do negative 2 minus 2x. They've got different variables. You can't combine them. So therefore, what you would just keep the negative 2x minus 2. Basically, just keep them. Again, we're putting the x term first because we want it in y equals mx plus b form. Now. <clears throat> we still don't have it in y equals mx plus b form because y's got a coefficient. We want y to be all by itself. How do you get rid of this 4? Anybody remember from algebra? Hopefully you all remember. But how do you get rid of this 4 over here? This is 4 times y, so you have to divide by 4. Good. And you can do that as long as you do it to every other point, as long as you do it to every other term in any algebraic uh, rule, you can do it as long as you do it to any other term. So the 4's cancel out, and you have y equals negative 2 divided by 4x. Now negative 2 divided by 4 is a half, so we'll call it negative 0.5x. When I'm writing these equations, I'd read, I like to use uh, decimals rather than fractions, just a little easier to deal with. But you can use fractions also if you like. Minus 2 divided by 4 is also 0.5. So as it just so happens, this happens to be 0.5x and negative 0.5. So our slope is whatever's next to the x, which is negative 0.5. And our y-intercept also happens to be negative 0.5. Again, they happen to be the same, although that, that is a coincidence. This means we want to graph the, the equation. So our y-intercept is negative 1 half. 
So I'm going to go along the y-axis and go to, go, go to negative one-half and draw my orange line over there. And it, the slope is negative a half, which means it goes down a half for every one over. So down a half, one over. Down a half, one over. Down a half, one over. Negative, therefore it's down, and a half because that's the slope. So down a half, so I can keep making points over here. We don't really need these many points. I'm just doing it for uh, oh, fun, I guess. <laughs> and we'll uh, let's draw the line. And all right, and this is what the line will look like. This is what our line will look like. Now, what about what was our previous equation? Anybody remember? What was, the, what was the one that we just did? What if we superimposed that one? I think the one we had there was y equals 2x plus, uh, plus 3. Well, what was the one we just did? y equals 2x plus... Let's do y equals 2x plus 3. That makes no difference. Uh, let's... Um, let's, div let's Okay, yeah. So let's, uh, let's graph this one again. The y-intercept, of course, is 3. And then up to 1 over. Up to 1 over. Up to 1 over. And then we can just go ahead and draw the line, which we will. All right. What do you notice, by the way, about the way the orange and the red lines crisscross each other? Yeah, they're perpendicular to each other. Aside from the fact that they look like they're perpendicular to each other, how else would we have known that they're perpendicular to each other. Remember the perpendicularity rule? Perpendicularity rule was they're perpendicular if they are negative reciprocals of each other. This slope was 2. This slope was negative 1 half. Are these two slopes negative reciprocals of each other? The answer is they are. This is a negative and this is a positive. And this is a half, this is 2 which is we flip a fraction. 2 is the same thing as 2 over 1, which is a reciprocal of 1 over 2. So these two happen to be reciprocals of each other. Okay. Now, let us take the opposite case. Let's take a line and figure out its equation. I want to do all three possibilities. I want to do one case where we're given the slope and a point on the line, and we have to figure out the equation. So again, we're given the slope and one point. The second case I want to discuss is when we're given two points. on the line, and the third is where we're given the line on a graph, and for each one I want to figure out how to actually figure out the equation. Okay, let's say we're given a slope of 3, and we say that it passes through, it passes through, let's say, 1, negative 4. And I want to figure out what is the slope of this, what is, what is the equation of this line. And then after we get the equation, obviously we can graph it very easily. Now, we know that all equations we want them to be in y equals mx plus b form. In this case, we have the slope we have an x value, of course not the only x value, but we have an x value. We have a y value. We don't have the y-intercept yet. But that's okay, we can just use this equation over here to solve for the y-intercept, to solve for the b. Instead of y equals mx plus b, we can substitute what we do have. We have a possible y value, which is negative 4. As long as you use the same point, it'll work. The slope is 3, that's the m. An x value we have is 1 plus b. And now we can figure out what b is by simply using this equation. Negative 4 equals 3 times, times b. To isolate b, we can subtract 3 from each side. 
and we have negative 7 equals b. So our y-intercept is negative 7. That makes our entire equation, we want it to in y equals mx plus b form, our slope is 3 of course, and our b is negative 7, so we'll make this minus 7, and this is our equation. How would we go about plotting this? Same thing as we did before, right? Let's take, let's plot 0, negative 7, because that's where it intersects the y-axis. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, and now we've got a slope of positive 3. So up 3, 1 over. Up 3, 1 over. Up 3, 1 over, etc. And then we can grab our line tool and we can draw the line. All right, so that's our first line. Let's take a second one where we're given two points. And first of all, again, just to be 100% accurate, let's make an arrow here and an arrow here. All right. Let's say we're given two points in the line. Let's say we're given point, uh, let's say this this line goes through point 2,2, two, and it also goes through point uh, negative 4, 4. How's that? 2,2 two and negative 4, 4. Now we got to figure out this equation. Now, we don't have the slope yet, but can we figure out the slope? The answer is yes, we can figure out the slope. Remember the formula to figure out the slope from last time? The formula was change in y divided by change in x, or the second y minus the first y divided by the second x minus the first x. Let's call this the second point, and this the first point again. As we discussed last time, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent about it, but let's just do it that way. So, our second y value, the bottom y value is 4, minus the first y value, which is 2. These are the y values, the one on the right side. The x values are on this side. Divided by our x value, our second x value, which is negative 4, minus our first x value, which is 2. So this is 4 minus 2 which is 2, divided by negative 4 and minus 2, which is negative 6. By the way, any, what's the relationship going to be between these two lines? And of course, I did this on purpose, but uh, they're going to be they're going to end up being perpendicular also, because they also got negative reciprocal slopes. 2 divided by negative 6 is negative a third. Or, of course, you can also write it as negative all right, so now we've got the slope. Okay, now we've got to figure out the y-intercept, right? Well, for that, we can use the same formula as we did before, right? We have y equals mx plus b. We can use either, either point. We can use this point or we can use that point. Let's use the top point. It's a little, a little easier to deal with. So the y is 2. The m is 0.33, you know, a third of 2 also, that was also the x, plus b, so that's 2 equals, well, a third of 2 is 0 0.66, that's 2 thirds, plus b, and then subtract point six six from each side, so the b equals looks like 1 and a third, or 1.33. Again, all I did was I just solved for b, which means our y-intercept is 1.33. Uh, the negative... Oh, one second. Oh, you mean, you mean this was... N right, okay, so right, good point, very good point. So this was negative. 0.33 times 2, right? This should have been negative, so this should have added 0.66. You're right, I'm sorry. So this should have added, in order to cancel out, I should have added 0.66 to each side, so our b actually becomes 2 plus 0.66, which is 2.66. Good point. Thank you. All right, so let's start our 
y intercept at 2.66, it's 2 and 2 thirds, okay, well, somewhere around there. Now, our slope is negative a third, which means down a third, one over. And then down a third, one over, and then down a third, one over, and then down a third, one over, and then down a third, one over. And as it turns out, this line is going to look something like this. Okay. And again, of course, notice the two lines are perpendicular to each other because they've got negative reciprocal slopes. One of them is negative a third and the other is positive three, which are negative reciprocals of each other. Now, does it hit both of these points? Well, let's see. Does it hit 2, 2? 1, 2, 1, 2. Yep, it hits 2, 2 right there. And we're just checking to make sure if we're right. It hits and our second point was negative 4, positive 4, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is right there. Both points, of course, are on the line, as both points have to be from the line. Now let's just take a line and work backwards to create the equation. All right, let's try the purple line. For the purple line, we're going to have to figure out an equation for the purple line. Now, which way should we do it? Truth is, we can do either way. We can either work backwards and get the y-intercept and figure out the slope, or we can use two points. There are many, many different ways we can do this. Let's try the y-intercept approach first. What's the y-intercept for the purple line? Can anybody tell me? Let's just count the number of... One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that's right. The B is six. Good. Now, what's the slope? Well, we can either figure out the slope mathematically, or we could figure out the slope just by looking at it. The slope, by the way, is... Can everybody tell it's going to be one up, one over, one up, one over, one up, one over? Yes, the slope is one. You know, mathematically, we also could have figured it out by using two different points. You know, this point, let's say, it crossed through six, zero, and, of course, it also crossed through 7, 1. So if we were using the slope, which was the second y minus the first y divided by the second x minus the first x, that's the same thing as, let's say, this is the second point and this is the first point. So the y's would be 1 minus 0, and the x's would be 7 minus 6, which is 1 over 1, which is 1. You know, if you take any two points and figure, and figure out the slope, it, that's the way it would work. So, therefore, the slope, the it's y equals the slope, which is 1x, which is the same thing as just plain x. You don't have to write the 1, because 1x and x are the same thing, plus 6. So the purple equation is simply y equals x plus 6. Okay. All right perpendicular bisector of a line. Again, bisector just means that this, each one is half. Now let's, let's find the perpendicular bisector of this line. Let's, that's, a good, that's a good application question. I'm going to draw a line, and then I would like us to figure out the perpendicular bisector of that line. The line that happens to be the perpendicular bisector of that line. I'm just going to draw a line and I'm going to say, okay, uh, there we go. Now, obviously, this is a line segment, so the two ends of the segment are here and here, and I ask you, Find the perpendicular bisector of the green line, uh, segment, not line. Okay. Now, obviously, perpendicular means it crosses at a right angle. And bisector means it crosses at its midpoint. Okay, so 
let's, what's the first thing we should do? First thing we should do is we should figure out uh, where is its, where are its two endpoints. Now its two endpoints are here and here. That's negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3. So I've got negative 7, th negative 3, right? And on the right side, I've got positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I've got positive 9, 5. Okay, so, in first of all, in order to figure out what is per what's going to be perpendicular to it, what's the first thing we need to establish? we need to establish its slope. Um, you don't even need the distance formula here. You know, you could use, the, you know, even using this, I don't know if, I don't even know how you would get it. I mean, you could figure out the distance, obviously, but then you'd have to figure out what's halfway in between, so you'd have to kind of use trial and error. I mean, you could use the distance formula, but it would be much harder. Remember, the midpoint formula, the midpoint formula is simply the average of the x and the average of the y. The average of the x is the uh, second x minus the first x, excuse me, ah. to over 2, and the second y minus the first y over 2. Again, that looks complicated, but all it really means is the average x and the average y, right? So what's our midpoint here? Our midpoint, and again, we can use this as our second point, and this is our first point. As long as you're consistent about it, it makes no difference. So our x's are 9 and negative 7. 9 minus negative 7, so it's positive 7. I'm sorry, <sighs> these have to be positive, obviously. I'm sorry, I, this has the average, to get the average, need, they need to be positive, not, uh, they need to be positive, not negative. Obviously, if you have the average of 10 and 8, well, it will be 10 plus 8 over 2, which, of course, would give you 9, because 10 plus 8 is 18. So for that, you have to add them. So it's 9 plus negative 7, which is minus 7 over 2, and the y are 5 and negative 3. So the second is 5 plus negative 3, which is minus 3, also over 2. So our midpoint is 9 minus 7 is 2 over 2, which is 1. And 5 minus 3 is also 2 over 2, which is also 1. Okay. So as it turns out, our midpoint, which I'm going to put in a different color over here, is 1, 1. I'm going to put that right here. Now, obviously, that's on the line. Is that Does that look like the midpoint? Looks like it, right? I mean, just from the naked eye, it looks, you know, it looks pretty, pretty much like that. Okay, so now that's so fine. So one, so whatever we, whatever our new line, whatever our perpend by uh, our perpendicular bisector, I'll write it up here. Our perpendicular bisector, that signal means perpendicular, of course, must pass through the point one and one because it's got to cross that line. Now it's got to be perpendicular. Okay, well let's figure out what does its slope have to be. Well, what's the slope of the green line? Slope of the green line is the change in y divided by the change in x. y2 minus y1 this time, of course, over x2 minus x1. So let's figure that out. Uh, the y's are 5 and negative 3. 5 minus negative 3, which is positive 3, over the x which is 9 minus negative 7, which is 9 plus 7, equals 8 over 16, which is the same thing as 1 half. So the slope is 1 half or 0 0.5. Okay, fine. So for our perpendicular bisector, what does its slope have to be? What does our perpendicular bisector slope have to be? Okay, you're close. Yeah, the negative reciprocal. So the other one is one half. So the so the slope of the perpendicular bisector it can't, it, it's not two. It has to be negative two, right? Because this is positive a half. So this has to be negative negative two. It has to be the negative reciprocal. So our new equation. We know that our that our perpendicular bisector equation has to pass through one one, and it has to have a slope of negative two. We don't know what its y-intercept is. So that's no problem. Let's solve for it. 
Remember y equals mx plus b. Our y is 1. We can use the 1, and we can use that for the x too. The, the slope is negative 2 times the x value, which is 1 again, because again it passes through the point 1, 1. Now we can solve, I'm sorry, this is a plus, not, not a... Uh, an equal sign. Now this becomes 1 equals negative 2 plus b. So add 2 to each side and you have b equals 1 plus 2 which is 3. Alright, so that means our the slow, the equation of our perpendicular bisector is y equals the slope which is negative 2 x plus b which is 3. Let's draw it and make sure it works. Make sure it makes sense. So the equation is going to be, I'm sorry, the y-intercept is positive 3, so that's right over here at 0 and negative 3. And the negative 2 slope means down to 1 over, and that's already there, and then down to 1 over, down to 1 over, down to 1 over. And let's draw the line. Start down here. Alright, there we go. And of course this is a line, so we'll put an arrow here and an arrow here. And the blue line is now the perpendicular bisector of the green line segment. All we did was we had to make sure that it has a negative reciprocal slope, and we have to make sure that it crosses the midpoint, and we made sure both things happen. Okay, systems of equations. What if you have two equations? Now, obviously, listen, if I tell you that uh, x plus y equals 3, there's no way to figure, figure out what x is, because x could be 1 and y could be 2, x could be 2, y could be 1, x could be 3, y could be 0, etc. But if I give you two equations, there is a way to figure out what they both are. If I tell you that x plus y equals 3, and I tell you that uh, 2x plus... Um, you know, plus uh, 2x plus 5y equals 15. Here there is a way to figure out what y is and what x is. Now, you can do it algebraically, and in the algebra course we discussed ways in which you can do it. In this course, I want to discuss how to do it graphically. And the way to do it graphically is to simply draw both equations and see where they crisscross. And then afterwards, let's do it algebraically just to make it just to make sure that we're doing it right. But let's draw this let's graph this equation first and this equation second. Okay, so x plus y equals 3. Again, we don't have it in y equals mx plus b form yet, so let's subtract the x from each side in order to get y equals negative x plus 3. I'm keeping this in, in the x term first. So now we've got it in y equals mx plus b form. Our slope is whatever is next to the x, which is a negative 1, because x is the same thing as 1x, just like x, if you, do, if you had y equals x plus something, then the slope was 1, so if it's negative x, so the slope is negative 1, and the y-intercept is, of course, positive 3. So for the green slope, we'll do 1, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 1, 2, 3, and then our slope is negative 1, so 1 down, 1 over, 1 down, 1 over, 1 down, 1 over. Let's draw our, let's draw the line. Okay. All right, there we go. That's the orange line. And as I've done previously, I will simply put arrows on each end. All right, now let's try the second one. The second one, a little harder, 2x plus 5y equals 15. Now again, we want to get the y by itself, so I'm going to subtract 2x from each side, and we'll get 5y equals negative 2x. 
uh, let's say plus 15. Again, just using the x term first and the plain term next. Now we want to isolate y, so we'll divide by 5, and we'll divide this by 5, and divide that by 5. So y equals negative 2 fifths x plus 15 divided by 5, which is 3. Huh, interesting. Yeah, okay. That's what they're going to, they're going to so they, it looks like they're going to cross on the, uh, on the intercepts, which is fine. Huh. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and graph it. All right. So we can graph it by first putting our y-intercept. Um, of course, our slope is negative 2 fifths, which is the same thing as negative 0 0.4. The y-intercept is, of course, positive 3. So we can put the y-intercept in the y-intercept here. And then it's 2 down 5. It's two, right, it's negative 2 over 5, so it's 2 down 5 over. Two, it's a little harder that way, but it's 2 for every 5. And it's negative, so it's down. So it's 2 down 5 over. 2 down 5 over. So the line is going to look something like this. We'll start over here. And the line will look something like this. Okay. So these are the two lines. And where do they crisscross? Well, they crisscross right here. They crisscross right here at 0, 3. That's a solution set. That's where they meet. And of course, if we tried them out, would they both work? Well, of course, this means x equals 0 and y equals 3. That's what 0, 3 means. And let's see if they each work. If x is 0 and y is 3, then 0 plus 3 is, of course, 3. And here, if x is 0 and y is 3, well, that also works, because if x is uh, 0, then this whole term is 0, plus, three time, plus 5 times 3 is 15. So that works as well. All right. Okay, good. So that's where the two the two things intersect. All right. Um, now, if we're solving algebraically. Well, you know, I, I won't bother solving algebraically, but if you recall how to solve things algebraically and you, 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 did, you did it that way, it would work. It would work. It would work as well. All right. Notice that there are no solutions if the lines are parallel. If the lines are parallel, there is no solution set. I mean, just to give you an example, what's the solution set where I have two lines? Let's say one of them is y equals 2x plus 4, and the other is y equals 2x plus 1 these are never going to there's it's impossible to get the same to get the to get one to get one solution set for both of these and the reason is because they've got they're parallel to each other if they're parallel to each other they're never going to crisscross you know the top one is you know starts at 1 2 it starts right over here and it has a slope of positive 2 so it's going to look something like this Yeah, it's going to look something like this, and the other one has a slope ha, starts um, has a y-intercept at positive one, so it's going to look something like this. And notice because of the fact that they're parallel, that wasn't okay. Let me draw that again. Because of the fact that they're parallel, they're never going to crisscross, and. 
Well, all right. Anyway, if you and if you tried the numbers, you'd see it would be impossible to uh, you know to to get one set of numbers for x and y that are going to satisfy both equations. All right. Let's take something like that. The one um the one on the slide over here. Let's say we've got this is a parallelogram. And the way you know it's a parallelogram, the way this shape the way you know that this particular shape is a parallelogram is because well there are several different ways there is because the opposite sides are parallel and opposite sides are equal you can you can do both of them let's take the one in fact i'm going to draw i'm going to draw this one on this on this set of axes you know i'll draw a different one rather than drawing this one let me draw a different one let me draw four points and then i want to establish how i know that this is a parallelogram Okay, let's say I establish this quadrilateral here. All right. And I tell you, this is quadrilateral A, B, C, D. And I ask you to prove that A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. That's the symbol for parallelogram. Okay. Now, what are two ways we can prove that A, B, C, D is a parallelogram? What, what are two ways that we can prove that anything is a parallelogram? Number one is to prove that the opposite sides are equal. Both pairs of opposite sides are equal. And the other one is to prove that both of them, that opposite sides are parallel. Let's do both. Let's figure out the lengths of each side, and let's figure out the slope of each side. Okay, first of all, let's do the easy one. What about DC? What's the length of DC? Well, this is a straight line, so we can simply count, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And how about AB? Well, AB also. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the, this opposite side is 10, this opposite side is 10. Let's do AD. Now, what is point D? Point D is negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4. So point D is negative 7 and 4. And point A is negative 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1. So A is point negative 4, negative 1. And then, of course, let's do B and C while we're at it. C is what? C is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. So C is point 3, 4. And B is point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 1. So this is point 6, negative 1. Okay, so now let's find the distances. Let's find the distance of AD. Now let's we can use the distance formula or we can use the Pythagorean theorem. Which one do you want to do? Should we use the distance formula or should we use the Pythagorean theorem? You know, the Pythagorean theorem we can draw like a little right triangle here and here and then figure out what, uh, what the diagonal is here. Anybody have a preference? I'll do either one. Alright, let's try the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so Let's draw, and I'll, I'll use a thin little uh, orange line, or I'm sorry, green, light green, green line. And, and again, this is the exact same thing as the distance formula, just drawing these. One, two, this is three, and this is one, two, three, four, five. This is 5. Let me use a little bit of a darker shade of green. Sorry, this is 5. I counted the boxes, and this is 3. So if I want to figure out what this is, if I want to figure out what the diagonal is, I could say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And of course, 
a squared is 3 squared plus b squared is 5 squared equals c squared. That's 9 plus 25 equals c squared. Take the square root of each side, and c equals the square root of 34. Now that's a radical. We, we could figure it out. It's approximately 5. Point, uh, probably about 5.8 or 5.9, something like that. It's pr pretty close to 6. But anyway, so c is c is the square root. This side is the square root of 34. Well, what about the other side? What about CD? You know, for B, by the way, for BC, let's use, let, this time let's do the, uh, the distance formula. Just because we did the Pythagorean theorem this time, let's use the distance formula. Distance formula was the x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Okay. So, what were our two points? Our two points were 3 and 4 and 6 and negative 1. Those are our points B and C. Okay, let's use this as our second point and this is our first point. And let us plug it in. Our second x was 6 minus our first x is 3 squared plus, and our second y was negative 1 and our first well, actually, we reversed it, but again, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent about it. So, and negative 1 minus 4 squared. So that means d equals 6 minus 3 squared, which is 3 squared, plus negative 5 squared, which is d equals the square root of 3 squared, which is 9, plus negative 5 squared, which is 25, and so d equals the square root of 34 which means this side is the square root of 34. Well, now we have proven that DC is equal to AB and CB is equal to AD and therefore ABCD must be a parallelogram. Okay, now let's try doing the slopes. Okay, let's figure out the slope. First of all, what's the slope of CD? Can everybody figure out what the slope of CD is? slope of CD is going to be zero, right? Because it's flat. Just like we discussed last time, the y is never, the y is, the change in y is always going to be zero. Think about it. It's four minus four. The top, the top remember, the, the, the way to figure out the slope was the second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. Well, the x is, the, the y's are always the same. So it's going to be four minus four. A flat line like this is always going to have a zero slope. So the slope of CD is zero. What's the slope of AB? Also zero, right? Same reason. It's flat, exactly. All right, so, so we've got this is parallel to this because they've got the same slope. Well, now let us try, I'm running out of colors here. Let's try red now. Now let's try the slope of AD and CB. So let's try the slope of AD equals, and again, the slope formula is the second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. And again, let's, so let's use this as our second point and this as our first point. So our second y is 4, and our first y is negative 1, so that's minus negative 1, so it's positive 1 divided by our, our second x, which was negative 7, uh, minus negative 4, which is positive 4. So it turns out that it's 4 plus 1, which is 5, divided by negative 7 plus 4, which is negative 3. So it's negative 5 thirds, which is the same thing as negative 1.66. Okay. So that's the slope of that. Now let's take the slope of the other side. Let's take the slope of BC. All right. Well, we got two points over here. We'll call this our, our first point, this our second point. So we've got our second y, which is 4, minus our first y, which is negative 1, which is negative, negative 1, so it, overall it's positive 1, divided by our second x, which is 3, minus our first x, which is 6, which is 4 plus 1, divided by 3 minus 6 is negative 3, which is also 
negative 5 thirds or negative 1.66. So they've got the same slopes. AD has the same slope of BC, which means AD and BC are parallel. Now we've proven that both opposite sides are parallel, and therefore, congratulations, we have proven that this is a parallelogram. All right. Equation of a circle. I'm not going to discuss this in too much detail, but basically, a circle works where you have both an x term and a y term are squared. A line was when neither were squared. Where one of them is squared, you have something called a parabola, which is like a u or an upside down u or a sideways u. Basically, a parabola looks something like this or like this or like this or like this. Basically, if the x squared, if the x is squared, it's going to look like this. If the x, if it's a negative x squared, it's going to look like this. If the y is squared, it's going to look like this. If the negative y squared is lo it looks like this, fine. But that again, that's something that covered more in in the algebra course. I'm not going to focus on it too much now. I am just going to quickly go over when both are squared. You've got a complete round shape. It could be a circle. It could be something called an ellipse, which is kind of like an oval, like an egg-shaped thing. Or it could even be something called a hyperbola, which is a really weird thing where you have two semicircles with their backs facing each other. Okay, but the only one that I'm really going to focus on is a circle. A circle is where both terms are squared, and the last term is the radius. So if you have, for example, x squared plus y squared equals 25, let's say, whatever the square root of this term is, the square root of whatever that is the radius of the circle. So what is the square root of 25 over here? Of course the answer is 5. And the center of the circle, unless established otherwise, the center is the origin. The center is 0, 0, unless you have something a little, little more complicated. So here the center will be the origin, the center will be the middle, and we'll put a 5, he, we'll They'll basically, it'll be a circle that, that's 5 in every direction. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 in this direction, 5 in that direction, 5 in that direction, 5 in that direction, and let me see if it'll let me draw a circle that's, that, that works over here. No, it's going to, one second, it's, if I start from here, is it going to let me draw a circle? Yeah, okay, actually, not, this looks not too bad. Okay, there we go. That's the circle. This means, by the way, the reason, by the way, the reason why it is a circle is because uh, because the x and y terms are both squared, it's going to have the exact same features in the negative as the positive, because anything squared is a positive anyway. So to give you an example, by the way, notice, notice where, where it crisscrosses at times. It crisscrosses here and here. This is at point 0.43, and this is at point 0.34. 3 and 4 works. Where x is 3 and y is 4, does, does this equation work? Where x is 3, it would be 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 25, which of course works. And the same thing is true at 4, 3. At 4, 3, x squared is 4 squared plus y squared is 3 squared equals 25, and that works too, for the same reason. And, of course, it also works where these things are negative. You know, at this point, let's say over here at negative 4, 3, it also works because the x is negative 4 squared plus 3 squared equals 25. And, of course, negative 4 squared is positive 16. And so whether x is, y is negative and y is negative really makes no difference. They're going to behave the same in all four quadrants. That's what makes it a circle. Um, okay, now, if the center is off the origin, then instead it's written in a little bit of a different form. It's written x minus or plus something and y minus or plus something. Let me give you an example. What if we have an equation that looks something like this? 
we have an equation that's that says let's say x plus 2 plus y minus 3 this is squared that's squared also equals um, 49 okay first thing this tells you is that the radius is the square root of whatever is over here so the radius is the square root of 49 which means the radius is 7 it also tells you that the center is not quite in the origin the center is whatever is the negative value of whatever is over here so the x value of the center is negative 2 and the y value is the negative values whatever whatever is over there which is negative negative 3 which is positive 3 which means the center is negative 2 3 which is right here and the radius is 7 so I'm gonna draw a circle hopefully with a radius of 7 Is that about right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, I think that's about right. Let me just. All right, looks about right. It's close. Actually, I think I just messed it up at the very end, but it's it's close enough. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me draw another. Well, anyway. So the radius is 7 in all directions. The point is the center is here and the radius is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that actually should have been a little stretched out over here and over here. 7 up this way, 7 down this way. The radius, wherever I go to the edge, whether I draw a segment from here or to here, 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 these, are all, these lines are all going to be 7 apiece because that's the radius of the circle. All right. Uh, finally, the last thing that I wanted to discuss is that you can actually figure out angles from a graph as well. And that you can do using trigonometry. You all remember trigonometry, I assume? A little bit, maybe? Let's say I wanted to figure out what is the angle that this takes off on the horizon? Let's say I've got an airplane over here, and it starts at the origin, and the airplane shoots off like this. And I want to figure out what is the angle that this plane shoots off of. I want to figure out, you know, this is where it starts, and so this angle, I want to figure out what this angle is. Well, the way I can do this is by forming a right triangle and using trigonometry to figure it out. I can take any point and draw a right triangle. You know, let's let's find a place where it's nice and even so it'll be easy to count. Let's find a place where it crisscrosses at a corner, which is over here. And I'll draw a line this way. And again, I just did that because I wanted to be able to count how the orange side is 1 2 3 4 5 6. The bottom side is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. Now, if I want to figure out what this angle is, which relationship can I use of the three things? Anybody remember we had sine was the opposite over the hypotenuse. We had cosine was the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And the tangent was opposite over the adjacent. What can we use in this case? Well, we could use the sign if we had the hypotenuse. Now, the truth is we could, we could use any, any of the three, but we'd have to figure out the hypotenuse first. In order to use the sine or the cosine, remember, the sine or the cosine both require the hypotenuse in, in its calculations. Now, so, the, I mean, over here on the, on the slide it says the tan, using the tangent rule. The reason why I said using the, using the tangent rule is because this gets us the opposite and the adjacent. Theoretically, if we, you know, we could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the hypotenuse is, and then we could use the sine or the cosine also. But what do we have relative to this angle over here? We've got the opposite, which is 6. And we've got the adjacent side, which is 14. Which means the tangent of this angle, whatever this angle is, we'll call it theta, which usually means, it means an angle. 
So the tangent is 6 divided by 14. Now 6 divided by 14 is uh, same thing as 1 over is same thing as um, 3 over 7. 3 over 7 is well, you know, let's uh, let's let's do it in a calculator here. Uh, where do I have? Do I? Ha um, I'm gonna bring up a. Calculator here. Well, first of all, so three divided by seven or six divided by fourteen is the same thing. So it's point four two, approximately point four two eight six. We'll say. So a tangent is approximately point four two. We'll round it off to point four two nine. Now, if I want to figure out what the tangent is, well, I can use the arctan function. Let's clear this first of all, which is where you have the angle, you have the tangent and you need the angle. So I'm going to click arctan again. Arctan is what you is what you use when you know what, the regular tangent function is when you know what the tangent is and, you, and then then you need to figure out the side. Here we know what the sides are. We know what the ratio is. Now we need to figure out the angle. So I'll put arctan of point uh, four two nine. And that equals 23.22, approximately. We'll round it off to 23. So our angle equals 23.22 degrees. That's our angle over here. So this angle is 23.22 degrees, approximately. And it looks like about that, right? It's certainly a very shallow angle. This, of course, would be 90 degrees, and so this would be whatever's left over. So the point is, using something like this, like the one, like the one in the on the slide as well, you can then figure out what the um, what you know what what the angle is in a graph using using these trigonometric functions. All right, um, it's now about the top of the hour, so I think we're about done with what we wanted to discuss today. Again, next time, which is our very last class, believe it or not, uh, we're going to spend about the first half of class discussing transformations, which is a relatively easy subject, and then I am going to go over whatever you like. You know, you want to come to class and you're not sure how to do something, you're not sure how to do one of the homework questions, you're not sure how to do something on the exam, uh, you know, please come to class prepared with whatever you have questions on, and I will be happy to go over absolutely anything uh, with regard to the course. Uh, the final exam will also be posted